Bottom of the barrel, hey. bottom of the barrel, cause hey. the barrel is only hey. two. Uh, Bob, not sure what episode this is. Take one. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you back to Bottom of the Barrel, the podcast hosted by myself and my co-host, Wes, uh, Wes Barker, who is not here today. Uh, Wes is currently in Vancouver. I believe he's uh, doing a magic lecture and performing as well. And we had some back and forths whether or not uh, we should either skip this week, uh, do a remote sort of uh, podcasts, like a Zoom thing, or uh, for me to have a guest, or for me to simply just come on here and, and chat with you guys. And we chose the latter, mainly because um, we're pretty overextended. We got a lot of projects going on. Wes is doing his thing right now. And so I didn't want to take any more of anyone else's time. Uh, Arthur isn't even here today. Artie's not even here. So it's just me and you guys. That being said, I'm going to give you the fucking chill. Because uh, that's something we got to do in order, apparently, to keep this thing going. So if you don't mind, uh, subscribe, like this video. We got a Patreon. We're regularly uploading once a week at least to Patreon right now. So a lot of content there. Um, overtime, Bob's basically after the podcast. We continue the podcast into the Patreon. So, you know, going there, help it, helping us out really does help us out. Also, uh, Manscaped, if you're looking to trim your junk and you're looking to smoothen out your ball sack, I don't know, check out manscaped.com uh, and use promo code BOTTOM to save 20% plus free shipping on your Manscaped order. I use Manscaped. I've been using Manscaped. It's fantastic, and uh, I couldn't recommend it enough, so check that out, manscaped.com, promo code BOTTOM. All right, enough of that. What a lengthy intro that was. It feels super weird to be here and to just like talk to no one, just the camera. But I treat you, the viewer, the camera in this case, as another person. If you were looking at me from an outside, you would just see me talking to this, you know, little mechanism as if it were a person. I guess that's where AI is headed. Anyways, let's not get in too deep. How are you guys doing? Um, really appreciating all the support in the Patreon as well and all the comments you guys have left and questions and stuff like that. Uh, we're going to run through them when Wes gets back. I got a few announcements. Uh, one in particular, which I thought was, well, it made my day. Uh, I was sort of mentioned on the Joe Rogan podcast, the biggest podcast in the world. Um, and we'll here, we'll play the clip in case you guys haven't seen it. It's a big deal for me. Ugh, look at this. Look at this. This shirt's too tight. It's not. I just picked it up. Shout out to Zydax as well, who gave me this shirt, but uh, not sure about the fit. All right, hold on. Let me pull this up. There's going to be some radio silence because I'm alone today, so bear with me. Mm -mm -mm. Here it is. I look at puzzles. I'm like, this is stupid. No, I love it. It's you very feel that way too, Jamie. It's like it's you meta. Don't now. There's a cool. There's a couple. I think if there's one big YouTube channel, this guy like buys the most expensive puzzle you can find. Yeah. And it's to be like this block. You're like, well, how the fuck do you open this? And he'll spend five hours trying to figure out how to open it and show you the whole thing. Yeah, great. He fast forwards past all the boring shit, but like it's <laughs> it's interesting. It's, okay, that's know. a different kind of puzzle, right? That indeed, Joe, is a different kind of puzzle, my dude. Um, shout out to Jamie, the young Jamie, uh, Jamie, who's been basically Joe Rogan's producer for the longest time. Uh, he was the one who kind of went like, eh, I don't know. Puzzles are cool. And I think, by the way, uh, Joe was talking about jigsaw puzzles and the guests as well. They were talking about jigsaw puzzles and Joe goes, when I look at a puzzle, I, I go, that's fucking stupid. Uh, which is a wild way to talk about anything that someone else is interested in. It's a wild thing to say. Um, you know, I'm a fan of Joe Rogan. I'm a fan of his podcast. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's a hot take to be like, that's this girl's like, I love puzzle. It helps me meditate or whatever. And he's like, when I look at puzzle, I, I just think it's fucking stupid. <laughs> so I, I thought it was funny that Jamie came into the rescue of not only the guest, but, uh, rescued 
basically, you know, throwing himself in front of a bullet uh, for puzzles everywhere and saying, no, 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 they're not all lame. And I would argue that jigsaw puzzles aren't lame either. Yes, they're one dimensional most for the most part. Uh, but they do help people and they, and they, uh, they bring people together and all sorts of cool stuff that, uh, that maybe he wasn't thinking about at the time, but indeed the puzzles that, you know, we solve. And that's, that's just another thing too. First of all, shout out to Jamie. Thank you so much. That, you know, meant a lot to me to, to just hear like my content float around on another, um, platform i'm on a really big platform uh and i you know it's just like kind of surreal uh hearing that I, I you don't get used to it i don't think maybe you do maybe i haven't heard enough of it to get used to it is probably what it is but yeah um that's cool and i'm glad that uh I, i'm glad that you know it, it was just interesting to hear him talk about my content even briefly it's telling very telling and I look for these things as a content creator. I look for, and even as a magician, I look for other people's uh, opinions on the things that I do and hearing them speak to other people about it will give me unbiased and unfiltered sort of uh, criticism or praise or whatever it may be uh, in this case. Um, but he said, there's this channel, There's a, he says, there's a few channels, but there's this one uh, who who looks for the most expensive puzzles and then solves them. So first of all, that's super interesting because that's somebody describing my content in an elevator pitch and saying, there's a few, but there's the one guy who, this is his niche, he does the most expensive puzzles. And then he goes on by saying, uh, and he fast forward, like it, it'll take him like five hours and he fast forward through all the boring shit. Um, and so like, part of me is like, Oh, I guess people like when I uh, see it's not focusing right now. It's having a hard time. It's my mic is haunted. It's focusing only on my mic. I'm sorry to audio listeners everywhere in the world who are, who are, who have to be subjected to this. Maybe I'll just be like in line here. This is weird. I really got to fix the focus. Is what I got to do. Sorry, guys. All right. I think that should be good. I just put on manual focus here. All right. Sorry about that. Technical issues. Um, yeah, we're back. So it's just interesting to hear someone else's elevator pitch about my content. And it makes me wonder if I should switch it up or... Not switch it up, just focus more on what that simplified idea of my channel is sometimes. But I'm always thinking. I think as uh, I think it's important as someone who does content for a living. Um, dude, I see so many people come and go uh, into content creation and you know, some, some people just aren't cut out for it and others find out that they're not cut out for it. I think that's, I think that's the whole, <laughs> the whole spectrum, uh, because it is tough. It is, uh, I don't want to say it's, you know, there's the, there's the cliche ness of me talking about how hard it is to make videos. Um, but there is something to be said about being in front of the camera constantly and, uh, appearing authentic. That's uh, that's a big one because people enjoy like this is this is this is my thing. I believe that people enjoy content in any form, whether it was TV or streaming or you know whatnot. I think they enjoy vulnerability, authenticity, reality. Um, so if you look at when reality television started with uh, Survivor, it was a big craze until people started finding out that, oh, okay, maybe it's scripted and it wasn't being as authentic as it proposed to be. Uh, along came, you know, YouTube, people flocked to that. And then that became a little bit more scripted and then, you know, go live streaming. Now we need it live streamed, but you know, so it's, people are looking to just connect with other people who are being genuine because it allows them to feel like it's okay to be genuine. If that makes sense. 
Um, there's also the catch 22 of people want you to be relatable. And so you make videos on your authentic self and being relatable to them. But then you get a following and with that following comes, you know, better financial freedom and, and all sorts of cool things and celebrities, you know, uh, status and all these things. Right. Um, so then how do you be relatable? How do you keep being relatable when you're, when you're there? And I think that's a lot of what I think about when, before I make a video and sometimes it's what um, stops me from making a video. Sometimes mid video, I'll be like, I'm not feeling it, man. This all feels like bullshit. It all feels like I'm being fake. And so I look for that sometimes and I sometimes can feel it. And sometimes it's just like, Hey, you know, we got to pay the bills. So like, just man up and do it, do this video. Um, but that's not necessarily fun. And I'm not saying that work has to be fun, but I'm saying that it's different when you're putting yourself in front of a camera. It's different. It's not like I've done manual labor for half my life. You know, I've worked some pretty crap jobs as you guys know, but, uh, definitely having, uh, to put yourself out there constantly is such a bigger toll on you mentally, obviously. Um, you just, uh, you just can't see it. That's the thing, right? Just people can't see that. And then, you know, people in my position shouldn't be complaining either. So there's the whole catch 22 thing where it's a very bizarre, uh, place to be, but I'm going to stop talking about that and we're going to get into some other things. I promise I've been, uh, I've been actually, this is cool. I've been actually, um, super inspired by old magic books lately and I have so many of them lying around. I bought some I've bought at a library in New York. Others I've bought in auctions. I found online. Uh, they were given to me. I have all these old magic books. And what I'm finding in these old magic books and what I've known on all, all along, but is now confirmed, is that the best things really are in those books. I've seen so many things in those magic books that have become marketed effects today that it's almost ridiculous. Like nothing is original. Everything, <laughs> everything already existed. Um, and there's some really cool stuff. And I find the, uh, I find the interesting thing is that magicians back then when writing, you would have the tricks you would have were mainly about, um, where you're performing magic, eh? and what you would have on you or around you in that setting. And I, mind you, a lot of magic is like that, but it was much more the case back then. Um, I'll give you some examples. Uh, there's whole chapters on cigarettes, handkerchiefs, uh, the cuffs, the small cuffs that the, uh, the, the napkins come in at the restaurant, plates, um, you know, thimbles was, was a thing. Uh, billiard balls. And so, and nowadays it's just like, Hey, you can do something with uh juicy fruit. You know what I mean? Uh, so it was a lot different back then. Cause you had only a few items to choose from, but what was cool about that is that they've extended the maximum potential of magic. They could have squeezed out of these items in these books. And so you get some really clever and off the wall ideas. Um, I actually have this handkerchief here that I got from Dan and Dave. And uh, this is a, like a super dope looking handkerchief, but there's so much magic you can do with this. Um, I, I was thinking, let, let me know uh, in the comments, by the way, guys, if this is something that you, you'd, you'd want to see. I was going to talk to Wes about this. I think I did mention it to him over FaceTime, but I want to do this series which explores these old books and the gems that are hidden in them. Um, I'd call the series like oldest trick in the book. And then there'd be magic with handkerchiefs and, and, you know, uh, napkin cuffs and, and, and thimbles or whatever it is, whatever 
that they were into back then and taking a look at dissecting how they taught these tricks, how they presented these tricks, what the scenario was and kind of like a, almost like a historic time piece, but at the same time, a tutorial. And if it sparks, uh, you know, people's imagination out there, well then all the better. It's something I've been wanting to do. Where's my whiskey? Oh, here it is. <laughs> it's, right here. <laughs> it's right here, guys. Yeah. What else is going on in the world? Oh, Elon Musk uh, is, dude, Elon Musk is like the Kanye West of Twitter. Even though Kanye West is pretty insane on Twitter, Elon Musk has like, I feel like he's losing it, but part of me says he's he's never had it. Like he was all along, he was just batshit crazy stringing us along for this wild acid trip that he's on. Uh, I'm a fan of any uh, anybody wanting to push civilization forward. All right, I'm a fan of the act of wanting to push them forward. I can separate that act from the person. I don't know Elon Musk personally, um, but I do enjoy the trolling. I enjoy the trolling. He's kind of leaned into it where most people would have folded under that pressure and caved under the pressure, the social pressure of people, you know, writing you uh, mean tweets or whatever it is. A lot of people would have caved to that. So instead he leaned into it and was like, I'm just going to, I'm going to double down on this, uh, on this thing instead of uh, backing or shying away from it. And I, so part of me respects that because it, must be an insurmountable amount of fucking stress unless you're as autistic as he is uh, and you just don't realize it. I think that's what the case is, to be honest. Um, but it's wild out there, man. It's wild. Like, I don't I don't necessarily have an opinion on, you know, when people say, wow, freedom of speech, freedom of this, freedom of that. Like, I still am of the school that, hey, Twitter isn't owned by the public. And I think that's one thing they wanted to get to is not have that private entity's interest involved because a pri with a private entity like Twitter, like um, what happens with that is that you have shareholders, but you also have um, advertisers and those advertising dollars are what pays for the free platform, right? So without the advertisers, you have no platform without content moderation, you have no advertisers, simply put, right? And uh, sort of YouTube went through this uh, years ago uh, when PewDiePie said some shit and uh, there was the whole uh, ad apocalypse where ads were backing off the site because there was, again, not enough censorship for what went out there. Because people, Coca-Cola doesn't want to see their ad next to the N-word on Twitter, right? That's just, and that's fair, you know? So that is that is fair. As if I was a CEO of a company or if I was in charge of head of marketing at Coca-Cola and I had to spend my budget, do you think it would look good for me if my boss caught wind of our ad being placed next to a swastika or anything like that, any, any hate speech or whatever it was, right? I'd lose my job. So I understand, I'm trying to understand all perspectives when it comes to this thing. And I think that the people uh, that work in advertising, I think they're, they're right to want to protect their brand. But I think the problem is much bigger. I think the problem is that people aren't ready for free, for free speech. I don't think people are ready for free speech because every time someone champions free speech, there's something that someone says that, uh, that makes them angry and, and makes them want to deplatform them or whatever it is. So I don't think people are ready for the idea of free speech. And I'm not even saying if complete free speech, you know, would be the answer. I'm just saying that with free speech, like you really have to think because it's everything. And then some of you are like, well, free speech except hate speech, right? But then we delve into the murky territory of what do you consider hate speech? And some people out there think that misidentifying a gender is considered a hate crime. So it becomes murky very fast. It's either free speech or it isn't. 
And I think that like right now, Jack, the ex-CEO of Twitter and Elon are talking. There's been like leak DMs and stuff. And I think they've both been wanting to move towards a community owned platform, something on the blockchain, something that uh, no one has a share in per se, or no one has a, like there are no advertising. There's no advertising. It would have to be a completely free platform. But then again, for people to be interested in wanting to create it and run it with the servers and everything else, it would also have to be monetized. And so the answer there, and you know what? A lot of this um, I've talked about to a lot of people, Vero on, um, well, on Vero, the app Vero is, I think the closest thing we have to a perfect social platform and, and not enough people use it. And I mean that in every way. Uh, there's no advertising on Vero. There's no ads and there's no algorithm. Everything is based on uh, your feed being uh, in chronological order of the people or hashtags you follow, period. That's it. And so every day you wake up, you can scroll through who posted what on your page and that's it. You're caught up. You're not spending hours and hours and hours on this platform. It's get in, look, get what you want to see or what you want to look for and then get out. And I like that a lot. Uh, but the thing that they've also figured out is that, well, for this to function and for us to keep this up to date, we would need this to be uh, financially feasible. And so they ask for a monthly fee. And I think that's the way to go. Um, I don't think Twitter blue is the like, oh, it actually might be. So check this out. If everybody got Twitter blue, regardless of the price, let's say, let's say it was a dollar instead of $8, right? But if everybody got Twitter blue, uh, they would essentially be able to remove the ads. Uh, and if they remove the ads, they would be a platform that would be allowed to say whatever it wanted to say, period. And that's something I can get behind. I have a small amount of libertarian in me uh, that, and I know there's some of you out there that are saying, yeah, but like you shouldn't be able to like threaten someone's life. Uh, yeah, there. I think law still exists. I think that like a death threat or threatening someone's life, um, someone should be allowed to say that if they want to. I think so. If they want to, they should be allowed to say it. Now, there should be consequences also. And I think the person should know about the consequences before they choose to say such a thing. And if they do say such a thing in a free speech world, again, this is completely free speech, well, then they're going to have to deal with the consequences with the authorities or whatever it is. But this platform, you can say whatever you want. I like the idea of that. I like the idea of say whatever it is you want period. State your opinion, state your whatever. And just because your opinion is different from another person, holy fuck, I can't stress this enough. It does not make that person a bad person, dude. Uh, I have lots of friends that have a varying, you know, that have varying degrees of uh, opinions, like from right to left and everywhere in between. And I'm sure, I'm sure you guys do too. Do you love those people any less? No, of course not. But online, it's your identity. And when you're identified as something online, well, you're going to get people who identify as the opposite. And then you're gonna have a you're gonna have a spat. So I don't like partaking and stuff like that. I think everybody is entitled to their own opinion. I, I really do. No matter I like it's gonna sound how it sounds, no matter how hateful or whatever, they're entitled to it. It's their life, it's their breath, it's their mind. They can say whatever the fuck they want to say. Now, there are consequences to what you want to say. So I do think people should be able to say whatever they want to say, but obviously, yeah, there should be, you know, consequences for very severe uh things as well. It's like, I heard this a while ago. I don't remember where I heard it from, but I will, I might not agree with what someone has to say, but I will fight for their right to say it. I love that so much. I think the world needs more of that. I think the world needs more of fucking chill out, dude. You know, words are, are, are you know, sticks and stones, all that, all that jazz. I don't know. 
I'm ranting. What else you want me to do? I'm fucking here alone with you guys. Drinking a good old whiskey. Kill Karen. Kill Karen, 12 year old single malt scotch whiskey. From Campbellton, Glengyle Distillery. 46%. Whoa. Product of Scotland, matured in oak. Yeah, this is um yeah, let's get off that Twitter rant bullshit for a second. This is uh this is a cool thing I learned with a handkerchief recently, actually. I'll show you guys something. Uh it's a cool technique to like uh take a watch during presentation. So basically you would uh you would put the watch in the middle here. You would fold like this, fold under, fold under, and then fold like this. And now it would be all wrapped up. And you could hand that out, you know, and, and put it on the table or something. And you secretly sort of stoling it out. It, it's a little it's a little bizarre. Sorry, I'm trying to see if the focus is fine. It's, uh, it's a little bizarre. I'm playing around with this idea, but it was an idea I found in an old book. And I think I might need a stiffer handkerchief. Um, but, uh, I love the idea of wrapping something up and stealing it out while everyone thinks it's still there. Wow. Wes just sent me, <laughs> this is crazy. What? Hold on. Wes just sent a, uh, a picture. I guess he's at, um, I guess he's buying like a gift card or something or a, a birthday card. And it says big card energy. We'll put it up here. Big card energy. He's in Vancouver and he sent us a text and he said, uh, just landed in Vancouver and started thinking about when we shot the pilot for big trick energy. He's like, that was the fucking best, maybe the best part. And dude, man, that was a trip. I'm not going to reminisce about that show any longer, but yeah, it was some of my favorite times. What else we got going on? What's going on with Kanye? Anything going on with Kanye? <laughs> I guess that's what that's what this has come to. It's like uh Kanye is the new what's the weather? <laughs> you know, when you see somebody and you just don't know what to say anymore, you just go, yeah. How about that Kanye West? Oh, I did uh, I did some stand up and magic yesterday on stage, which was a lot of fun. I went to the Bordel Comedy Club, my buddy Mike Ward, it's his comedy club, and uh that night was hosted. It's an Anglo night in Quebec, which means English only. And it was hosted by Pantelis and a lot of good Montreal comics, a lot of good Montreal comics. One guy who was recently on Kill Tony, my favorite podcast, like uh and he crushed it and I met him there and he was pretty cool. Might have him on. I might ask him to come sit in on Bob. He seems like a nice guy. And, um, and yeah, I mean, it was great. It, there was like 50, 60 people. It wasn't a sold-out show, but I think a lot of people were trying out new material. We had about five to ten minutes each. And so I started my set with like three, three and a half minutes of just comedy, uh, which I think went over pretty well. Uh, but I do think people are surprised when they see me uh, on stage because, first of all, like 50 people and like imagine if you're like subscribed to me and you don't know that I'm going to be there. You're like, what the fuck is this? Right? <laughs> Why is this guy here? He's on my phone. What is he doing here? And uh, and then I come out, you know, and and, um, and do some. Uh, you know, do some jokes <laughs> and I like, you know, I like dark humor. I like these type of jokes when I'm on stage. So, uh, might be very shocking. They're like, dude, you don't even fucking swear on your puzzle channel. And now I just, you, you're doing like, you're doing jokes, jokes, you know? Um, so it might, might be a little bit of a shock to people, but eventually I say, all right, time for magic. And they're all happy. And I do some magic and we're still pretty, pretty funny with it with the magic, but all overall went well. I tried out a brand new trick, uh, that is amazing. Uh, I might be able to upload it eventually, uh, for you guys to see, but it's, uh, it's something, it's a work in progress. I've only done it once and it worked 
and uh, I got to tweak it a little bit. So even though I have the footage, I'd rather tweak uh, and, and play with it a little bit and get it to where it needs to be. But it is really good. It is already really, really good. Uh, I was very happy that it went well. So look forward to sharing that with you guys. Wes and I have been trying to coordinate a date to uh, to do a show, like a uh, two-man sort of half hour each. And maybe with some special guests in between. So kind of like the live podcast we did, but without the podcasting part, mainly the performance part. So I'd go up, have a half an hour, or we'd have a we'd have somebody open. We come out, say hi, I'd have half an hour, somebody else in between, and then like Wes close the show or something like that. Something to that extent. Uh so that would be cool to work on. And it's something we want to do over and over and over to get our material tight, especially me. I don't perform as much as Wes on stage. He's out there doing it professionally. So I do need to uh, work off all this rust and stuff like that. But it's fun, man. Being on stage, there's nothing better. There's nothing better, dude. I, I, I Right before getting on stage, like I don't care anymore. And I love that so much. I don't care. I don't care about how I'm perceived. I'm over it. I've gotten to an age where I don't care in general whether it's on camera or whether it's, you know, in your car or, or in person or, or for whatever, I don't care. If I choose not to care, I cannot care. And it's fun when you get on stage, not caring. And you're like, Hey man, this is going to go the way it goes. I'm not looking for you to laugh. I'm looking for you to like say, Hey, I'd have a drink with this guy. And by doing so you're going to end up laughing. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's so much fun to just, be vulnerable, be yourself and allow people to be their selves and connect with them using, you know, magic and comedy. I fucking love it so fucking much. It's so good. I hope all of you guys can, can come out to see our live podcast one day and be so cool to have you there. You guys are like literally the best. Every When we went across Canada and met a bunch of you, it was so much fun. Like, you guys know how to drink, <laughs> first of all. Our audience is a drinking audience. Uh, but also, you guys are funny. And you guys appreciate good humor. And, and you're my tribe. So I I love you guys so much. I'm getting super weird and sappy while sipping on some whiskey. That's right. That's what this uh, episode's about. Yeah. See what else is going on. I look at my phone. I just look at my um, my camera roll to give me like inspiration. I've been going to the gym a lot, <laughs> trying to get these these guns, trying to get these gains. But um, I've been going to the gym. It's funny because like when we shot Big Trick Energy, I was two hundred and forty four pounds at my max weight. I've never been heavier. But that was also like I was lifting a lot, uh, but I was consuming a shit ton of protein and I wasn't burning it off, right? So I was just getting bulky, uh, but also a lot of that fat stayed. And during the shooting of Big Trick Energy, I had some like heart problems. I had uh, some fucking ocular migraines due to stress and and. I was, you know, I was just in a bad way health wise, even though I was working out physically, I wasn't doing any cardio or anything else. And I was kind of eating like shit and, uh, I'd get heart palpitations and all of this. I went to go see my doctor and doctors like you have high blood pressure, which blew my socks off. I'm an athletic person by nature. Someone who did sports all the time. You know, I never thought, Hey man, I'm going to be at risk for a heart attack or a stroke. Never. And I smoked for years as well. But uh, that's when it hit me when he, you know, he was like, yeah, you got to stop eating these foods. You got to start exercising like immediately. And I was like, oh, shit. And so that really threw me for a loop. And uh, I've become pretty strict on diet, like not super strict, but 80% of my diet, my diet is paleo. Uh, so pretty much straight from the ground or straight from the animal, straight from the farm type thing. Uh no sugars, um, no, uh, just just a lot of different things I, I can't eat, like anything processed, basically. And by doing that, uh, I came down like 30 pounds. 
Um, so I know a lot of people in the comments are like, oh, Chris, like, they're like, oh, you look tired or you look sickly or you know, look, it was my, my diet, right? I did this diet. I felt like I've never had more energy than I did. Uh, but at the same time, I wasn't working out. I wasn't really exercising. I was, but maybe once a week type thing. And uh, ever since I've been going back to the gym, so it's been a couple of weeks now, I've been feeling healthier. I've been looking healthier. Um, and I'm doing a lot of cardio. I'm doing, trying to get, trying to get some abs back, you know, doing all sorts of crazy things, but it feels good, man. It feels good. It feels really, really good. And especially my age, you know, I'm getting a point where I can start thinking about this shit seriously, dude. Uh, things can go south real quick, you know, for a guy that likes to party and eat burgers and shit. So, you know, got to take care of yourself out there. If you're not doing anything out there physically, I, I totally get it also. Because doing it, starting it is so tough. And I had to go and restart working out so many times before I stuck with it. And even now, like I still have to force myself to stick with it. It's not, uh, but the results actually help the motivation. Uh, and the fear of losing those results actually is motivating to me as well. So it's just kind of, I've tried to put it into a daily thing no matter what I do. And if I take a day off, you know, I'll still do cardio or I'll still do something else. And it's really, it's really important. You know, most people out there are dying from dumb shit that they could avoid. So just avoid it. Don't eat like shit. Do some exercise. Is this the Joe Rogan podcast? Is that what this has turned into? Eat elk meat. Hunt your own food. Hate jigsaw puzzles. All right. I think I'm going to leave it at that, gang. It's been a short, Bob. I understand, but this is like an update, Bob. And it's a chance for me to connect with you. And I really hope that Wes ends up doing the same and just get shit off his chest. Uh, he's the one who started Bob by himself. If you check it out, episode one on his channel, uh, it was just him. So uh, I think the next time that we find ourselves in this lull, I think we'll get Wes to just uh, to film one of these heart-to-hearts with you guys and just fucking rant about shit. It's fun. It's good to get it off your chest. And um, I've realized so much lately, and I've realized lately, I've, I've always realized that I, I talk over people, especially Wes in the podcast quite a bit. Um, which always like hurts me. I'm like, oh, when I see it, I'm like, why was I being, why is it? It didn't feel like that at the moment. I feel like I had a really, you know, something really poignant to say, but I forget that Wes also has very valid input and that I appreciate his input. So I've been working on listening to Wes a lot more. And, I, you know, I'm hearing you guys, but not today. <laughs> Today's my time. Me, me, me. All right, whatever. Guys, thanks so much for for hanging out with me. I really appreciate it. I know it's a short episode, and we'll be back with your regular uploads and your Patreons and everything else, but we do appreciate you guys here uh, to no extent. We've gone above and beyond trying to make this podcast so cool and everything it can be, and uh, all we need is just your support to keep going. So thank you. Appreciate you, and tell three friends. We'll see you on the next one.